So generous. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's the problem. I spent, so, I, I wrote too much for the technical, for the policy side, and then I didn't spend my time on the technical. The technical, <laughs> I think Eric is a stricter grader. No, Thank you. 
I'm going to go to the defense. I'm going to go to the defense. Are you going to head them out? Yeah. Is Eric coming? No. No? He's a dude. I'm going to hand out to Eugen, and as Eric announced, uh, please uh, report to your his dissatisfaction <laughs> about the Eugen by tomorrow, right? Yeah. Have you seen that the announcement on yeah. D-Courses? Yes. Yeah. Lens? Is that here? Nara? Here. 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 Aaron? Yeah. 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 You are Aaron, not Eric. Oh, I'm Aaron, yeah. Chelsea? Yeah. Yeah. Scott? Yeah. And then? Fiona, any? Nikki, Austin?
So we're going to discuss the que questions about the exam on Wednesday. And please report to your, your uh, concerns by tomorrow via email to Eric and me, of course, right? OK. So welcome back. So today, <clears throat> we're going to take a look primarily at Vipin Naram's approach to study proliferation. So just by way of uh, background and introduction, Um, most of the work on proliferation has been both historical, looking at which countries acquired nuclear weapons when did they start the test, and the evolution of their uh, nuclear arsenal, and um, then questions about future proliferators, which is basically what we did in, when we discussed this topic. Narang said what has been missing is an analysis of how these new nuclear weapon states actually consider using their nuclear weapon, what their nuclear posture is, and why is it the way it is. Um, so it's not examining who acquired them and who tested it when, but rather how existing nuclear powers use their posture to support their strategic interests looking at France, China, Israel, India, Pakistan, North Korea, and South Africa. Um, I would say also by way of background that at least most American specialists on the subject, and I think most others as well, believe that the next use of nuclear weapons, which hasn't happened since 1945, would likely uh, happen between the middle powers that, again, there's no guarantee, there's no data you can use to justify it. The US-Russian uh, nuclear balance remains stable from an American perspective. Not clear what the Russian perspective is. And uh, even though China has acquired new nuclear weapons with ICBM capabilities to attack the continent of the United States, that that uh, balance is also stable in the sense that neither side really has an incentive to strike first for fear that the retaliation would be very destructive. And in fact, there's a whole concept of strategic stability, uh, which has been a core issue in the evolution of nuclear strategy during the nuclear age. And there is a question now with new nuclear weapon states, and also with other capabilities, particularly cyber and eventually space capabilities, whether strategic stability really remains as we have understood it. I was just away when you had your exam in Washington for a meeting, which is an annual meeting where what I call the nuclear weapon mafia would meet to review the status of things. These are the heads of the three weapons labs. Marcus Livermore, Los Alamos, and Sandia, other top people from those labs, people from the military, people from, uh, the, in this case, the Trump administration, a few academics, very few, and uh, some other specialists from think tanks in, in the field, and some non american And um, basically, they were looking at the theme, which is in some of the Trump new documents, like the Nuclear Posture Review and the Nuclear and the National Security Strategy Paper, which is what they're calling, what the Trump administration is calling the return of great power competition. Even a few years ago under Obama, when I served, the Nuclear Posture Review stated that the top priority was concerned about terrorist use of nuclear weapons. Uh, this was at the beginning of 2009, 2010. Uh, Obama had hoped to restore a better relationship with the Russians that had been the case under George, George W. Bush and had hopes for a better relationship with China. <coughs> and this was before Russia went to Ukraine. And this was uh, a much more hopeful time in great power relations. That attitude has been swept away by recent developments. 
So when Matt is the Secretary of Defense, he was making the case that it's great power competition that's at the top of the priority list, not uh, nuclear terrorism. So with that as general background, um, and, and I would just say, in personal view, it's actually not one or the other. It's both. We are, the problem of nuclear terrorism hasn't disappeared. Uh, but it's clearly difficult for these terrorist groups, whether it's Al-Qaeda or ISIS or others, to acquire the fissile material and the means of fabricating weapons or stealing whole weapons or developing the, uh, having the uh, launch vehicles to, to uh, use them. It's obviously much more difficult than some had first imagined. Um, whereas the intensity of the U.S.-Russia competition and the growing intensity of the U.S.-China competition is really a big deal. So uh, we're going to not look at that great power competition. Instead, we're going to look at competition within and among the so-called middle or regional powers. Is that uh, clear? Okay. So. Uh, In uh, Narang's work, and again, Narang is an Indian American who was a, a student at Stanford under Scott Sagan, who's a well known contributor to the literature and the integration. And uh, <coughs> Narang is now a professor at MIT. Um, he's done very well. He's written quite a lot of stuff on this and related subjects. Um, he postulated, again, it's not completely justifiable and you can't find quantitative means to confirm his approach. But uh, he postulates three different regional sorry, three different regional power nuclear postures. The first he calls a catalytic posture, which is to threaten nuclear weapons breakout in the event the state survival is threatened by conventional attack, conventional attack, in order to compel third party intervention on the state's behalf. And the example he uses is the Israeli Arab War of 73, the so called Yom Kippur War, which I'll discuss a little bit later in, the, uh, in this lecture. And I have discussed previously, I think, a little bit. This was a uh, map named Sukh has been able to get all of these wonderful maps. Uh, this showed uh, back in 67, Israel had seized a lot of the Sinai Desert that had been originally under Egyptian control for years. And they also, the Israelis also seized the Golan Heights from the Syrians. And in 73, there was this combined surprise attack. The Egyptians crossing the canal, pushing back the Israeli forces, and the Syrians moving, trying to break through. They never did completely break through once they broke up lines. Again, I'll come back to this in a moment. So this is now a, a case of a nuclear weapon state, Israel, because Israel had nuclear weapons by 73, being attacked conventionally by Egypt on the one hand and Syria on the other. Egypt and Syria were not deterred from attacking Israel, even though Israel had nuclear weapons and they didn't. <clears throat> and then Israel goes through this complicated, torturous process of trying to enlist American support. I, don't, I won't go further into this now, but I'll get back into it. Anyway, this is the first of the three regional nuclear postures that. Uh, that Naran addresses. So, but, uh, and I'll sort of make some editorial comments as I go along. I would say the issue here is that it's not crystal. If you just read the material of Naran, you'd think Israel's sole purpose in having nuclear weapons is to, if necessary, draw the Americans into a conflict um, uh, in order to defend them. And I would say from my own experience, and I have some knowledge of 
Israeli thinking on this, been there, discussed this, still engaged. Uh, that the Israelis have not solely relied on the United States. The United States is, can be an un, unreliable ally. Um, so I think that Israel has developed and deployed nuclear weapons for its own retaliatory use or its own deterrence use. But anyway, that's my view. That's not what I'm here to discuss. I'm here to discuss narrow. Any questions on catalytic posture? Yes. With the question about Israel's nuclear weapons, I thought uh, the Vela satellite incident happened in the late 70s. I thought the Vela satellite incident happened in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. It wasn't confirmed that they had nuclear weapons until then. Um, no, it, it was before that. It was, it was 1978. The Vela satellite picked up what some thought was a nuclear explosion in space, which would have been Israel's first nuclear weapons test, but not the beginning of its acquisition of nuclear weapons, which goes back to probably the 60s. The exact, those of you, some of you might be interested in one country or another, so I'll give you some references. There is a terrific book by a man named Abner Cohen, uh, who I think is an Israeli-American citizen, I think he's a Jewish citizen. And he interviewed a ton of Israelis who were willing to talk to him about Israeli nuclear weapons, and he's unique among them. And he wrote a book, it's something like Israel and the Bomb. It is uh, a very comprehensive treatment of the Israeli nuclear program from its earliest origins of the Ben-Gurion in the 50s, right up to into the 90s when he wrote it. Uh, he's now a professor at the Monterey Institute of International Studies, just down the road here in Monterey, California. And I actually have had him come speak in some of my classes in the past. He's very able, very interesting. And I wrote you in his book, so it's also possible. Um, so again, that was just a distinction between first detonation, because Israel otherwise is in this ambiguous category alone. Um, and they've never declared that they're a nuclear weapons state. So they've never declared. And they've never unquestionably tested, but the entire community views them as a nuclear weapon state with a whole bunch of nuclear weapons, which I discussed last time. Other questions? Or, we have time. This, this probably won't take the full class time to go through all this material. OK. The second uh, uh, nuclear posture that Naran, uh postulates is what he calls assured retaliation. Now this is really more familiar to us. This is, you know, goes back to the US, Soviet, US, Russia uh, relationship. Development of secure second strike nuclear capabilities to threaten certain nu certain nuclear retaliation should it suffer primarily a nuclear attack. And here you have a number of examples. Uh, Naran particularly cites India, India against China, China possibly against India, but also China against Russia and the Soviet Union, since they did have a war. Uh, the Soviet Union and China had a border war in 1969, and until recently have had sort of tense relations. They were on very good terms in the 50s into the early 60s when uh, the CIA obtained information of the major Sino-Soviet rift because the Chinese were complaining that the Russians were holding back on providing first rank technology and nuclear materials to China, which they were. They were not giving them top of the line assistance. Um, and also because after Stalin's death, uh, Chinese thought that they should be the leader of the international communist movement, which the Russians never relinquished, even though Stalin had died. Um, so there's actually there are a couple of different so-called dyadic bilateral relationships. Here. There's India versus China. There's India versus Pakistan. There's China 
versus Russia. But this is your classical secure second strike. This is the Wolfstetter uh, idea of the, if you have invulnerable second strike forces that can deliver a tremendous retaliation, then that's the closest you can get to a credible deterrent. Any questions about this possible? And then the third, the third regional hospital, we now are called asymmetric escalation, uh, where countries develop capabilities and procedures that credibly enable rapid first use of nuclear weapons in the event of a conventional attack. So uh, France uh, is really only potentially threatened by Russia. And it's sort of actually implausible that Russia would attack France with conventional weapons have to leapfrog over half of Europe to get to France. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, Pakistan could be subject to an Indian conventional attack and then seek to use its own nuclear weapons to deter or repel that attack. So those are the, yeah, yes. I thought France was afraid of, I, I mean, this, France was, they came out as an asymmetric escalation state at the point where there was a divide in Berlin. And so it wasn't, right. it wasn't super unrealistic. No, that's right. That was that was Cold War, but of course we're 25 years since the Cold War is over. You know, we're we're more in different time. Uh, I mean, assuming the Cold War is over, but uh, you know, the, the threat of a major, massive Russian conventional attack on Europe disappeared when the Soviet Union collapsed. And that was in 1991. The Russians did not have the conventional capability for a major armored uh, attack into Western Europe. Um, so it's a little antiquated. Other questions or comments on this? Yes. Yeah. So is France going to change its nuclear posture? Well, remember, these are Vipin Narang's own. No. <laughs> own categorization of these states in the world. They are not the official characterizations of any of these countries. This is now I'm saying, let me explain to you what's really going on here. So, but it's the first time this has been done, and it's very interesting work, and it could lead to further uh, creative work on cooperation. Now, uh, what the Narang did was he looked at a lot of history because there were a lot of crises be between and among these countries. And uh, there were some wars, conventional wars, no nuclear wars. Um, and then he used all that data and did some fancy statistical analysis, which I'm not going to go into, various multilateral, multi multilateral uh, statistical techniques. Well, he explains that in the book. And he has these hypotheses that he's testing. The first is that a catalytic posture would have little effect in deterring low or high intensity conflict initiated by either nuclear or non nuclear opponent. Catalytic posture, which is remember that's a call for the third party intervention, would have little effect in deterring a low or high intensity conflict initiated by either nuclear or non-nuclear opponent. That's a hypothesis that is statistically tested. Um, on assured retaliation, <coughs> he's testing the hypothesis that states with assured retaliation posture will face a reduced frequency of high intensity attacks from nuclear or non-nuclear opponents. The posture uh, the country with this posture would face an increased frequency of low intensity conventional attacks. Because again, 
in the real world where people make decisions about nuclear weapon use, you're not going to use nuclear weapons. Virtually no, no government can be authorized to use of nuclear weapons. There's a small incursion of some special forces into a small area. That's just not, not plausible. Again, it's not impossible, but it's not plausible. <clears throat> so uh, states with this posture face an increased frequency of low intensity conventional attacks initiated by nuclear opponents and an unchanged frequency of low intensity conventional attacks from non-nuclear opponents. Now, one of the trickier ones here is the India-Pakistan relationship. Because now, fast forward, it's been 20 years since India and Pakistan both declared themselves as nuclear weapon states, tested nuclear weapons, and are considered nuclear weapon states, even though it's outside the NPT. Right? It was May of 1998. First India, and then within a week, Pakistan, both detonated nuclear devices and declared themselves officially as nuclear weapon states. Uh, and they've been involved in a whole host of low, low intensity skirmishes um, throughout their history since 1947, since India and Pakistan became separate states as the British Empire uh, was dissolved. And the most recent one just happened a few weeks ago we were talking about when uh, actually India responded to a terrorist attack by Pakistan in Indian territory by uh, using its air force, and it's quite a capable air force, to attack targets in Pakistan and one of the pilots was shot down, one of the Indian pilots was shot down. But as an and, you know, tensions were very high it was never publicized, but I bet almost certainly the Trump administration sent emissaries to uh, Delhi and to Islamabad to try to cool things. This has been historically our role, is to diffuse crises that can lead to nuclear exchanges. And now it seems to have receded, it's, it's receded over the front pages. And the pilot was returned. He wasn't tortured, he wasn't executed, and so forth. This remains one of the hottest topics among proliferation watchers of nuclear weapon use. And I'll talk again, I think I talked about it before, but I want to emphasize it again, and we'll come back to it. A particular scenario that's very worrisome in Washington and in Pakistan. So uh, again, if you have a assured retaliation posture, you're still vulnerable to low intensity conventional attack initiated by a nuclear opponent, but maybe no change in frequency of low intensity conventional attack from non nuclear opponents. Well, in this case, that's irrelevant to the impact in that both nuclear opponents. Questions about this? Someone else could have gone step by step here. Okay. So, th those are the first two. Hypotheses that are being tested by NARA statistically. And then the third is with this third posture called asymmetric escalation, where uh, NARA's null hypothesis is that the asymmetric escalation nuclear posture should face fewer attacks from both nuclear and non-nuclear opponents, of course, all measurable intensities go unconquered, because this implies that the state with asymmetric escalation, escalation capability can dominate the other state at every level of the escalation level, which, again, is not so easy to measure. You know, if you can have a Pencil and paper in Palo Alto to come up with these ideas. That's not necessarily not necessarily how the actual military commands think about the use of nuclear weapons in Islamabad and Delhi. Yeah. Do you actually publish any of this data used to form those categories anywhere? I, I, I was curious about that. Well, there's curious. data in the book, and there's reference in the book to other articles he's published on this. Yeah, that's the. I was talking about the tables of, you know, like likely, you know, like, like I, I couldn't find a definition. Maybe could be that. I couldn't find a definition for a lot of these things. Like, uh, 
Like, I, I don't know how we form the categories. So, you know, like, I, I would have thought, like, uh, given given a perceived threat, uh, mobilization of troops with with our like, armed capability, you know, nuclear armed capabilities, that would be some way he quantifies a a, a retaliatory mm -hmm. response. But I didn't find any data like that, mm -hmm. so, so I can't. I don't know which categories. Are so there is uh, some kind of a data set which is named uh, Correlation of War, published by the University of California at Davis. And most of the political scientists use that data set to prove uh, their uh, statistical analysis and arguments. And uh, Naran also uses that, that data. Yeah. Originally, it was developed by J. David Singer, a professor at the University of Michigan. It's called the Correlates of War Project. It was the first effort to quantify the study of war. And it actually split the community because many analysts and particularly many policymakers feel that you know, certain love between a man and a woman, uh, management <laughs> negotiations, there are certain things that are just not quantifiable, even though you are reticent to admit that. And so analysts critique this, saying this is it's clearly way off in all kinds of absurd directions. But others felt this is a, this is a scientific method approach to the study of war. And Singer was the first uh, major figure in this field. He was active in Michigan from the 60s to the 90s. He passed away about 20, 20 years ago. I knew him actually. He had some interesting conversations. Yes. Um, I'm wondering why, and I haven't had an answer in the value area to the discussion, but why, so I mean, Marianne clearly thinks that the uh, expansion escalation is the most plausible deterrent. Um, and I'm wondering, like, I have found, like, I think the cost here is relatively similar to method retaliation, which was considered to be not plausible and not a deterrent. So uh -huh. I'm wondering, I guess, why, like, the difference that I can see, but like, and so it is totally justified to me is that like the expansion escalation specifically was like direct threats to the homeland versus like magic retaliation was like if you go and scare it, you have to launch a nuclear weapon. So like at the same time, part of what was implausible then and is still implausible now is that you would launch a nuclear weapon in response to like a low-ish level of conflict. So I guess I'm just sort of I know, that was like my main problem with a lot of I mean, I, 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 interp I interpret asymmetric escalation. If you and I are in a potential conflict situation and I have an asymmetric escalation in group posture, my interpretation is that I'm able to dominate you at any level on the escalation ladder. If you send small numbers of irregular forces into my country, I'm going to defend against them and send larger, more effective numbers of your ability. Of special forces to your country. If there's a limited use of nuclear weapons, I could have a more effective attack on you with limited than you could. So it's a much more finely grained approach. Mass retaliation is you move some troops into Finland, I move Moscow. That's not really the same. Yeah. But, but, but to actually prove the asymmetric escalation capability of any two states is not easy. Yes? Uh, I was just going to say, I guess in that case, it sounds less like a posture and more like a circumstance. Like, like um, it just happens to be the case that this country is sort of better or has that capability. No, I mean, that would suggest that there's no purpose to the development of nuclear weapons. And, you know, nuclear postures are developed after a lot of detailed thought and analysis in every government because they're, you know, they're less expensive than some conventional weapons, but they're still pretty expensive. You don't just buy these weapons willy nilly and say, gee, wake up, holy cow, look at our capability versus the other guy. No, it's strategically intended to develop a capability okay. that could be dominant against the other guy. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. No? Just rubbing your eye? <laughs> I thought you had. Uh, any other comments or thoughts? It's fine to have 
queries or second guesses or uncertainties about this? Yeah, I don't know. What data do we collect? Is, is that updated every year? And yeah, this is a, it was continuously working on correlates and war project, which is now what you see David said in that mission. Right. And mentioned as right, it's the sort of Bible for quantitatively oriented students of war in political science. I would say it has limited attention from the professional war targeters and nuclear planners and the governments. That doesn't mean it's wrong. I mean, the government may be at the lunch. Okay, so is this it's sort of clear? Even if you don't fully accept it, that's fine. So we have major findings from the statistical analysis. The bottom line dominant finding in uh, Narang's book is that asymmetric escalation, that's like the dominant view at every level of the escalation line, uniquely and significantly deters conflict at every level of our entity. It's almost a tautology. So it's a you know, it says, uh, if I postulate at the beginning, that I can dominate you with two rubber bands versus one rubber band, or six rubber bands versus four rubber bands, or two nuclear versus one, then of course I'm going to be able to deter you at all levels. Um, this was one of the tables that Narayan published, some statistics of nuclear project frequency of attack, based on his look at uh, a lot of historical data. Um, so this, the punchline again is that it is this posture that is the most stable because it deters all levels of attack. That's the main thing. Okay, now then there's a separate subfield, which is this all had to do with uh, situations where ultimately there's some armed conflict between the adversaries. There's a war of some kind. But Naran says what's equally interesting and often more frequent is crisis behavior. So, you know, I'm yelling at you, you're yelling at me, I'm pushing at you, you're pushing at me, but there's no conflict. So, what does that look like? So, uh, <coughs> Naran says, Nuclear related nuclear posture crisis behavior. The first hypothesis crises are likely to be initiated by the assured retaliation state. That's on page 259 in the book. Um, uh, more likely to be initiated by the assured retaliation state since it is unlikely to be deterred by an ambiguous and unproven capability. There may be preventive war motivations if the catalytic states and behaviors are limited enough to theoretically be eliminated. Catalytic states should make veiled nuclear threats when armed action seems imminent in order to try to catalyze the intervention of an external force. So he does say it gets more complicated if the target of the assured retaliation state is a catalytic state, is a state that can try to rely on a third party to intervene. And then a uh, different hypothesis, Christ is more likely to be initiated by the asymmetric escalator. So yeah, I mean, if you've got the uh, Dominant capabilities, of course, all runs on the escalation ladder. You're going to push the other guy around. And you're more likely to institute a crisis. Let's see, again, back up from this, although I, I want to hesitate to get into these then. But I'm supposing you think that India has asymmetric escalation capability over Pakistan, uh, which it actually doesn't. But supposing it did, um, does that mean that India is more likely to precipitate a crisis? Yes, says Nara. 
And yet, most of the crises in India-Pakistan relations have been caused by terrorist-supported groups from Pakistan going into Indian territory. So Pakistan may be even possibly the weaker nuclear state, but yet it goes in and pushes around. This happened in Kashmir. It happened in Mumbai. By the way, in Mumbai, if you know about the Mumbai incident back in 2008, the HBO has a special movie. It's going to be on, I think, later this week or next week. If you have any of you have televisions, I know that's not <laughs> millennials have, but uh, there's something called television. And uh, if you can get a hold of it, you can watch it. It's a very good film. It's a very good film. This was Mumbai is, you know, Silicon Valley of India and uh, a hotel, mm -hmm. a fancy hotel with businessmen and folks in it was attacked by a group of Pakistanis who were uh, called terrorists. They were maybe trained by uh, an independent group in the Pakistan, maybe they were trained by the Pakistani government. Um, and they killed a lot of people. And in fact, in this film, the Indian intelligence service was able to intercept communications from the Pakistani to the headquarters of the group in Pakistan to the terrorists in Mumbai. And you hear the Pakistani leaders, and this is not the Pakistani government leaders, but the leaders of the group, uh, ordering the terrorists what to do. And at one point, it's really quite a hair-raising moment. It says, look, remember, your job is to kill as many women and children as possible and then be killed yourself. That's your job. That's the goal. It's to maximize the level of terror that the Indian population is feeling. And you can sacrifice yourself to do that. So uh, anyway, that film will, will be on. It was on before. It's coming back. I think, I think this week. Um, third hypothesis in crisis behaviors states is on the posture that security efficient. There should be no difference in deterrence power between postures. Again, this is uh, you know I think that makes some sense statistically. But it's, it's a little bit remote from the reality of planning a nuclear force. Um, on page 60, it says the very existence of nuclear capabilities should provide a sufficient deterrent to conventional strategic aggression. It should, but it doesn't. I mean, Indian nuclear weapons have not deterred. Pakistan conventional attack on India. Israeli nuclear weapons have not deterred many times Arab attack on Israel. It's just not true. It may be logically true, but it's not true empirically. Okay. Uh, nuclear strategy is a middle power. Uh, so here, this is a map of what happened in Mumbai last time. But I want to show this, not because of what uh, Narak writes about, but because of this other, uh, the Mumbai 08 attack is, is on page 279 in Narak and goes on for two pages. But uh, a few years ago, uh, I was at, uh, in attendance at a unclassified but sort of sensitive meeting on future conflict between India and Pakistan, a U.S. only group. And uh, what was conveyed at the meeting, this was several years ago, was that Obama was still president before Trump came in. But the Obama uh, team was most concerned about the following scenario. Well, first of all, what happened in this case was, as I told you, Pakistani so-called terrorist groups that Pakistan disavows. They may or may not be connected to the Pakistani government because Pakistan says no, it's nothing to do with us. But they clearly launched from Pakistani territory. Uh, they go into Mumbai, kill all these 
citizens, and then all of them were killed, all but one in this case. And the one was uh, questioned, I think he was tortured, and he gave a lot of information about the planning of the attack to the Jews. Um, at the time, uh, the Indian government was pressured a lot to retaliate against Pakistan, but chose not to do so. The Americans were pressing them not to retaliate, mm. uh, which is a very difficult pill for the Indians to swallow. Um, I forget how many people were killed, but there were 20 or 30 people killed. A lot of young children and they're all civilians. Um, so the concern that was raised at this meeting was that there's a repeat of the Mumbai attack, some other place, but not the Mumbai, some other place. Again, the target of the Pakistani terrorists is Indian civilians. Many of them are killed. The pressure on the Indian government, and this is the Modi, Modi government. Modi is a very tough Trump-like uh, ultra uh, Hindu nationalist. Uh, he would not abide by uh, lack of retaliation. He would retaliate according to this uh, concern. He'd retaliate with conventional strikes against the Pakistani terrorist groups in Pakistan. Conventional strikes. It could be maybe bringing in some armed forces, armored forces and aircraft to attack the Pakistani terrorist sites in Pakistan. Pakistan has been through a number of major armed conflicts with India since 1947 and has lost every one. And that the conjecture and the scenario planning is that Pakistan has no confidence that they can use its own conventional forces to repel Indian <coughs> forces in Pakistan. So instead, and this is what is the, the concern, <coughs> Pakistan uses small numbers of its own nuclear weapons on Indian troops in Pakistani territory in order to, to compel, this is compellence, not deterrence, to compel the Indians to withdraw. But instead, Modi takes that as the you know, first use of nuclear weapons against his forces. And that initiates a massive Indian nuclear strike against Pakistan. So this was the concern. This was the big concern of how a first use of nuclear weapons since 1945 would actually happen. And there was a lot of effort put into uh, explicating the scenario in some detail, and then actually sharing this information. Washington shared this information both with Indian and Pakistani leaders to say, look, you're really on a slippery slope here. Nobody wants a nuclear war. You don't want to see your cities in mushroom clouds. So you've got to back off. And at least so far, that particular scenario has not materialized. It even could have materialized just in this last recent uh, crisis when the, the, the Indians uh, used aircraft to attack and one of the planes was shot down and the pilot was taken prisoner. But it didn't. So they have their own understanding of how far they can go without you know, coming to the brink of nuclear war. Now, it doesn't mean they'll always do that. People make mistakes all the time. You know, it's just a human. I am the leader of making those mistakes, at least in the top 10. Um, but this gives you an idea what a slippery slope this can be. Yes. I was wondering if, uh, given that Pakistan has uh, disavowed um, these groups that carried out attacks right. in India, did they make any sort of claim about attempts to deal with it internally? Or like, like, like yeah. Pakistani forces? Right. Sometimes they have, it's a mixture, but there are many incidents, many, many, especially in Kashmir. Which is this, you know, disputed area when India and Pakistan was created. Pakistan was created as a Muslim state, 
even though India has more Muslims than Pakistan. India has over a billion people and has 250 or 280 million Muslims, which is far larger than the Pakistani population. Um, at different times, Pakistan has said they've tried to deal with these groups and were unsuccessful, or they denied the existence of the groups, or uh, they even claimed at some point that they did uh, destroy some of the groups. It's a mixture, it's a blend. But the, the historical reality is that every once in a while, there are Pakistani so-called subnational terrorist groups attacking Kashmir. Kashmir is a Muslim-dominated state that was given to India when India was created by the British and Pakistan. So Pakistan has never acknowledged in 1947 to today that Kashmir is part of India. And India says yes, it is, including just about British. And he says, well, who the hell is the British? So you have these lingering, long-standing disputes that are, and they're very, very emotional issues. I had an opportunity not that long ago, let's say two months ago, I gave a, a lecture with a scenario to a group of Indian government officials. I've done this before. This is right here in Berkeley. I never once used Kashmir scenario because I know how sensitive it is. And I use the Kashmir scenario. And the feedback from the students, the government officials, was very negative. <laughs> they said, not nah, it's a Pakistani sent, you know, it's not uh, giving due credit. And I, you know, the action was all set up in the most neutral kind of way, but it is a hyper emotional issue between India and Pakistan right now. And these are serious seasoned government officials, mostly men in their 50s who've been in government 20 or 30 years. These are not young kids with you know running around screaming. Um, but they weren't part of the Ministry of Defense, so it comes to my room. So you cannot underestimate may maybe that Kashmir doesn't mean much to you, but yours hell means a lot to them. Yes, that's it. So what's the strategic value of Kashmir? But does it have many resources or it's actually very highly mounted area? Yeah, it's a beautiful area. It's considered one of the most beautiful areas in the Indian subcontinent. I actually don't know enough about its own natural resources. That's easily find out of all. You know, there, there are many other examples of this, maybe not quite as prominent. For example, the Sino-Russian border. There's a 3,000 mile border between Russia and China. And who drew the border? The British. <laughs> the British drew the border. Well, who the hell are the British? <laughs> They're the colonial empire from 1700. So there are many, many disputed areas along the Sino Russian border today. There was an example of this that was the Surrey River that led to the Sino-Russian armed conflict in 1961. So I'd say among the students of non-proliferation who are also into this whole issue of next use of nuclear weapons, the Indo-Pakistani relationship remains maybe the top of the list of most likely next use of nuclear weapons, which of course we want to avoid at all costs. Yes. Um, this is kind of a, I guess, a, it's okay. guess a ridiculous question. Uh, I've written those answers. Okay. Uh, why? I guess why, 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 why do we care if Russia and India, or uh, sorry, Pakistan and India? Right. Yeah, well, so that's a hard note. So, and the answer is that uh, the U.S. position since 45 has been the more countries that have nuclear weapons, the more likely to be their use, and the more likely their use and the taboo is broken, 
and the more likely that there will be multiple uses of nuclear weapons, and we ourselves will be more vulnerable to the nuclear weapon, and we're just truly really transformative to the world. Okay. Tom Shelley, who I mentioned to you, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics for his work on strategy, developed the concept of compellence. In his Nobel laureate acceptance speech, which was in 2005 or 6, said this, the single most important development since 1945 has been the absence of nuclear weapon use since 1945. And who would have believed in 1945 that you know, 60, 70 years later, with all the crazy things that go on in the world, there'd be not one use of nuclear weapons. So the nuclear taboo has remained. Um, I was at a uh, meeting in the early 2000s, I think it was the 50th anniversary of Livermore. Livermore was started in 1952. And a group of panelists, including Bill Perry, from the Feds, and other very seasoned veterans, were on a panel. And then the moderator turned to the panelists and said, Okay, uh, we've had no nuclear weapon use from 1945 to today, 2002. How many of you think that there'll be no nuclear weapon use in the next 10 years by 2012? And only one person said he thought there would be no. Everybody else said that there, there would be use. It'd be a whole new ball game. Well, it hasn't happened. And we've had some pretty rough moments. We don't think we were close to the Cuban Missile Crisis. We were right on the edge. My brother would be. My professor would be. He certainly examples of the real life greater. This was no kidding around. And it actually, one of the things that led Kennedy to authorize an aggressive effort to negotiate a limited test bench was his own personal fear. The Cuban Missile Crisis really crystallized his personal fear of nuclear weapons. You know, you grow up today, here you haven't had them in all these, in all these years. A lot of surveys of attitudes of millennials and others equate nuclear weapons with the Cold War. The Cold War ended in 1991. That's going to be 30 years ago. Nuclear weapons don't mean anything in the current world. Yeah. And why do we have all this stuff? So I don't want to alarm you, but I wouldn't be too relaxed about lack of nuclear weapon use in your lifetime. And if there is nuclear weapon use, you're in a new world. You're in a completely new world. You know, most of the conjecture is that any nuclear weapon use will be a stimulant to further proliferation. It's not going to be that countries say, wow, that's a horrible thing, I'm giving up all my weapons. That's not how people and militaries and governments react. They'll say, we better get some. So it will increase proliferation, which will increase likelihood of additional use. You know, if the human species is capable of destroying itself, yeah, we're capable of doing anything. So I'm just, you know, probing these different edges of the problem. In that sense, I mean, NARA has performed useful service. You know? It's not just listing the numbers. And now, with the other example that NARA brings is the Young Kippur War 73. Discussed on page 291. So that was the one where, you know, the, uh, the Syrians are about to break through in the Golan Heights and the Egyptians are about to break through in the Sinai. Now, I think I mentioned this to you. Uh, when I started out in this field in the 70s, I was involved with a research center at Harvard and they had visiting fellows. And one year in the late 70s, so that would be about five years after the war, a visiting fellow was the Israeli commanding officer for the Golan Heights. And his name was Yanush Bengal. He died just a few years ago. He's an amazing figure. 
and uh, he said this was basically a joint surprise attack by Syria and Egypt against Israel. And Israel, despite its excellent intelligence, was completely caught off guard by the attack. There was hardly, there have been tons of studies done by the Israelis about why they were surprised. And one of the main findings of the literature on that is it was less the empirical data that it was in the mindset. They just couldn't believe that the Arabs would attack them after they were beaten so badly in 67 more. So Yanish Bengal woke up one morning to find that he had a brigade of Israeli forces that was confronted by two divisions of Syrian forces. That numbered about 20 to 1. And he sent back word to, uh, to Tel Aviv that he needed reinforcements. And they said, you have to wait 48 to 72 hours. Hold the line. At this time, um, this gets into the nuclear side, the defense minister of Israel, this man Moshe Dayan, who became a very prominent figure, he had one eye, he had a patch of his, that was like a pipe. He was a very he was well known in the Western world, dynamic figure. And he thought that the whole military situation in the Golan, where the Israelis were holding, and in the Sinai, where the Israelis were overrun, and the, and the Egyptians crossed the Sinai, crossed the canal into, into Israel, uh, Diane thought that the military situation was so grave for Israel's existence that he went to Golden Meir, who was the Prime Minister of Israel, woman Prime Minister, who had been a teacher in Milwaukee, and then had returned to Israel, and then got active in Israeli politics, and ended up being the Prime Minister. And Diane, this is all the uh, document, Diane went to Golden Meir and said, uh, there had been two prior temples in ancient times to the Jewish people, and the current Israeli state is the third temple. And Diane said to Golden Meir, we are witnessing right now the destruction of the Third Temple. And the only way to avoid it is to use nuclear weapons. And I want your authorization to get the weapons out of storage. They were, uh, they were mounted on delivery vehicles. And get them ready to use and use them to repel the Egyptian and the Syrian forces. And uh, Golden Meir, who wasn't an expert on this stuff, had a lot of gut feelings on things, said, I hear you, I'm going to contact the Americans. And this was a, a weird time, because in 73, this is in the middle of the Watergate crisis. Nixon was having a mental breakdown. Nixon was an alcoholic and was talking to the paintings in the hallways. And, and Kissinger, who was the national security advisor, and Schlesinger, who was the Secretary of Defense, both were alarmed that Nixon was unstable and shouldn't be engaged in decision-making that he said he had to do what he used. In fact, Schlesinger did something which is essentially illegal. Remember we talked earlier about the command control said the president is the only one that authorizes it, but the Secretary of Defense has to support it. If not, they can fire the Secretary of Defense get a different one. Schlesinger told the key people at SAC in the control of the weapons that do not go to your firing stations, do not consider using these weapons unless I personally have approved them. There's no legal basis for them. Basically, to, to, to disavow or control by the uh, uh, decision by the president. So Kissinger and Schlesinger were themselves making the decisions with the president absent about what to do about this hyper dangerous situation in Israel. And Kissinger originally had said, "Let the Israelis bleed a little bit." 
he thought that they had more sustained power and they could absorb some uh, casualties without getting to the point of nuclear weapon use. But after, after uh, the Americans got the information, the U.S. had intelligence that Mayer had asked, that that uh, that Diane had asked Golda Meir to get the nuclear weapons ready. He changed his mind, and he ordered. Uh, basically, we ordered Schlesinger to order the elevation of the U.S. alert system to the so-called DEFCON 3. Mm -hmm. DEFCON 3 is where actually the silo doors are open. The submarines go to their firing stations. The aircraft are launched and start going toward the enough return point for firing nuclear weapons. And he did that. So first of all, that Israel would know that he had their back. And secondly, that the Soviets would be deterred from intervening themselves. The Soviets were allied with Egypt. And I very much remember in 1973, I'm sure you guys were around, on the Today Show, the morning news show, Barbara Walters, who was the said, uh, we wake up this morning to learn that the United States has elevated its alert status to DEF CON 3, which is the highest level of alert since the start of the Cold War. So we weren't making a secret of this. We were trying to intentionally reassure the Israelis and deter the Soviets from intervening. The Soviets had nuclear armed missiles on ships headed toward Egypt, headed toward the port of Alexandria in Egypt. What happened then was there was no nuclear weapon use by Israel. There was no nuclear weapon use by the United States. There was no nuclear weapon use by the Soviet Union. And the Israelis regrouped, reinforced their forces in the north and then the Yanish Bengal leadership repelled the Syrians from going into Israel. Um, I was at Harvard when Yanish uh, Bengal gave a briefing on what he was facing. And he mentioned that uh, you can't see it really here, but that if this brigade of Israeli forces on the Golan was broken through by the Syrian divisions, there were no forces from there to Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv was completely vulnerable uh, to attack by Israel, Syrian armed forces. So this was by far the most threatening scenario in the history of Israel since 48. And then the, the Israelis regrouped and repulsed the Egyptians from across the Sinai and the Syrians both. It's amazing uh, retaliation by the Israelis. And they actually then surrounded the, Israel, the Egyptian Third Army, which was the premier army of Egypt, and had them completely surrounded in the Sinai when actually the Russians warned the Israelis not to attack. Egyptian army, or they would intervene. And that actually deterred the Israelis from, from wiping out the Egyptian Third Army. So you have multiple games of terror, deterrence and repellence going on here. And I spend the time with this, this is his data. Now, of course, it will, will, not, will never be replicated, it would be something totally different, but you get the idea. It's real people making decisions in crisis situations, very tense, people are up without any sleep. Um, there's been a, a studies done on behavioral capabilities of people in crisis. If they're very erratic, uh, you make crazy decisions, you hallucinate, you do all kinds of crazy things. So there's no guarantee something like this, India, Pakistan, or uh, 
Israeli Arab, or North Korea, Israel, as my sister's going to give a talk about North Korea later. I'm going to say just a word about it because Apple, again, the question of how we get. It. So, why does Syria invade Israel here? To return, to reclaim the Golan Heights, which is their territory, and if possible, to move toward the destruction of Israel, which they were committed to. Both Syria and Egypt were committed to the destruction of Israel. They destroy Israel by defeating them in a war. Why? Why? Because uh, none of the Arab states had recognized Israel's right to exist since it was established in 1948. They said this was a colonial intervention of placing the Jewish state in the middle of their territory, which is the entire Middle East. They never recognized that Israel was legitimate. It was just who, who, who established the the British. <laughs> Who the hell are the British? They're just the goddamn colonial occupiers of 200 years. And the only two states to this day, that of the 22 Arab states, the only two states that have recognized Israel are Egypt, and they did that when Sadat agreed to a peace treaty with Israel in 1979, and Jordan. They got back uh, part of the West Bank in 1979. Syria to this day, under Assad, backed by the Russians and the Iranians and Hezbollah, does not recognize Israel as a legitimate state. Saudi Arabia does not recognize it. None of the Arab states recognize Israel as a legitimate state. It's a pure, illegal, colonial enclave. They should go back to Europe or go to Cleveland. Go the hell somewhere else, but get the hell out of our neighborhood. You can't quantify that intensity. <laughs> Other questions or comments on this? So uh, here, uh, Narang summarized a whole bunch of crises that he had looked at. I'm not going to go through this now. Uh, some, a lot of them were India-Pakistani crises, and a few down here were the Israeli crises. And this is his optimization flow chart on page 302. Let me just go through this quickly. The regional nuclear power, that's any one of the states we talked about, has available a reliable third-party patron then they adopt the catalytic posture. So that would be Israel, in theory, having the patronage of the United States, or Pakistan has had the patronage of China. China, as the <coughs> adversary of India, has been a patron of Pakistan. If there's no available third party patron, are they facing conventionally superior offensive threats? If they are, then they want to have asymmetric escalation. That's the French example. That's of the uh, Russian invasion of Europe. If they're not facing approximate uh, offensive threats, then they have civil military arrangements leading to either assured retaliation or resource constraints lead to either of these conditions of assured retaliation or asymmetric escalation. And finally, we have an all discussed, we will at the end of the semester, and so I will give you a whole lecture on this, and that's the North Korean situation. And North, you know, we're not making up stuff about North Korea. Now you have, just over the weekend, I don't know if you were aware, just over this past weekend, Kim Jong-un said, unless the United States makes major concessions, we will resume nuclear weapons testing and missile testing. He just said that in the last 72 hours. 
And we know that a major goal of theirs has been nuclear armed ICBMs that could attack the continent of the United States. That's what they were working on when the negotiations started with uh, Trump. So according to, now this was, well, this is more recent stuff. Nairam was writing before that. Nairam said, Pyongyang needs a third party patron. And that's China. As long as China is a supporter of Pyongyang on the nuclear front, you know, they can be engaged in catalytic, uh, have a catalytic posture. If China withdraws its support, then Pyongyang will likely adopt a nuclear first use posture, either against South Korea, or against Japan, or against Guam, or against the continental of the United States, depending upon what capabilities they have. So this is, of course, an exercise to be determined by the reader. We are living through this uh, every day. Uh, obviously, the Hanoi summit was a failure. There's no evidence of North Korea seeking to negotiate away its nuclear weapons in return for economic assistance. Or, you know, Bush said you'd have all kinds of fancy resorts like the Mar-a-Lago Mar in Florida. Um, this didn't seem to appeal to uh, Kim Jong-un. So this raises a conundrum, and of course the North Korea nuclear issue has been an unresolved challenge for every U.S. administration since at least Clinton. I was in the government when Clinton was president. I went on the first trip by uh, Secretary of Defense to China since the Tiananmen Square incident. Uh, you know, Tiananmen Square was a major revolt of students in Beijing in 1989. And then there was a freeze of US connection with them until 1994 when Clinton authorized Bill Perry, then the Secretary of Defense, to go to China. I was a member of his team that went to China. And uh, at a meeting that Perry had with, uh, with um, the head of China at the time, the head of China was uh, before Jiang Zemin, but after, uh, I remember Li Peng was in the room. Li Peng was the orchestrator of the of the students at Tiananmen Square, uh, Perry said that if we can't get this resolved, there could be war between the United States and North Korea. And Clinton had gone to the demilitarized zone and made a public statement that said, if there's any North Korean military action, he just said military, he didn't say nuclear. Any military action against by North Korea against South Korea, Clinton, it would be a generation, that's 20 years, before anyone could safely set foot in North Korea. So that implies a massive US nuclear strike on North Korea, which may or may not have been credible, but he said it. The president's going to say these things off the cuff. So this is a hyper serious situation. This is at the top of the class, the head of the class among nuclear concerns. We don't have a handle on how to deal with the North Korean nuclear problem. And it's complex and involves management of US relations with South Korea, with Japan, and with China, which most Americans believe China doesn't want to see war on the Korean Peninsula. They'd like to see the status quo. They'd like to see a communist authoritarian North Korea and South Korea that they can trade with. The current world is the best possible world from a Chinese perspective. They don't want to see it get out of control. So this gets into the real world of concerns about crisis management and uh, 
how to manage nuclear proliferation. Questions, comments? Okay, now, uh, uh, coming attractions. We haven't mentioned, because Narayan didn't mention it because it wasn't on the agenda when he wrote the book, Iran. Remember, Iran has a nuclear posture. And this is important because Iran has a declaratory policy to wipe Israel off the map. That's been stated by the various the Ayatollah, Khomeini, and Khamenei, the two Iranian leaders. Their goal is to wipe Israel off the map. Uh, now, the Indian, Iranian nuclear posture had been halted by the U.S.-Iran multilateral JCPOA, I'll get into the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, until Trump came in. And Trump has now withdrawn the United States from the JCPOA. So there are no constraints on the JC, from the JCPOA on Iran, although Iran continues to adhere to the agreement. So any movement of an Iran nuclear posture has a big effect on U.S. nuclear and conventional forces, and it also has an effect on further proliferation in the area, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Egypt. I gave a talk near the end of my tenure in the Defense Department, and the military attaché from the Saudi embassy came up to me and said, I just want you to know, Dr. Tom, that if Iran gets nuclear weapons, we'll buy them from Pakistan. And I'm not kidding you that. And then there's the whole issue of DPRK and nuclear arsenal on U.S. South Korea and nuclear conventional forces. This is all coming attractions. Very, very dangerous. Every area is very dangerous. Just to give you some cheery thoughts. <laughs> so, uh, okay, we made it through, and we'll see you next time. Oh, so we're going to have a series of guest speakers, and the guest speaker Wednesday is George Moore. He's a fascinating guy. He was an IAEA analyst for five years. He's a graduate of the Nuclear Engineering Department at Berkeley, master's and PhD. He has a law degree from Berkeley. He's been a practicing attorney. He's, been, he's a flyer. He was a graduate of the Naval, uh, Naval Academy. He's an amazing guy. He'll be here Wednesday, 2 to 3.30, to talk about IAEA mm -hmm. verification and safety. Okay? The Jewish more is still in Monterey. Monterey. Great pleasure. Yeah, I was impressed myself. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think. No, no, 